Courtney is not only an amazing singer, but you, she's also a great woman of faith, and you were just prayed over. So it's a powerful prayer. Thank you, Courtney, for that prayer of healing for our people. Last week, I got the chance to get away for a couple of days, and Aaron did an outstanding job last weekend talking about don't judge, and he was filling in. And uh, it's great when I go away and I come back and people ask me to go away again on vacation so they can hear more <laughs> of guys like Aaron, just incredible. Um, one of the things I mentioned in the, uh, in the uh, announcement video is we're looking for some more help in the children's ministry. And um, so we're looking specifically for a couple people in the nursery. Um, we're looking actually for four um, preschool ministry volunteers, the threes and fours. They're not in the nursery, they're actually in their own class. And I'm telling you something... When my kids serve in the children's ministry, that is their favorite group of people to work with. So if you aren't serving in the preschool ministry, you are missing out on a lot of laughs and some crazy cute kids, and they're just amazing. So um, we're also looking for a um, kindergarten first um, helper as well, but preschool is definitely the largest need. So if you have a ministry gift in that area or you um, think that the Lord might be twisting your arm right now, tugging at your heart. Um, Heather's going to be at the Welcome Center after church, and she would love to twist your arm some more and chat with you a little bit more about um, serving in the children's ministry. Uh, the clip you're about to see right now, if, you, uh, if you're either too young to remember the movie, or you are too old and you just crawled out from underneath a rock, um, <laughs> it's a story about a family of five, they all have superpowers, the Incredibles. And uh, Mr. Incredible, the father of the family, has brought his family to a new community because every time they get discovered with their, with their incredible superhero powers, they have to relocate like a witness protection program because they're all living incognito. And, um, and so they have to hide their superpowers from their neighbors that surround them. Well, there's one in neighbor in particular who's been watching this family, and he's, he's sharp. He knows something is up, and so he watches every day for Mr. Incredible to come home so he can see something amazing. So here's the clip. What are you waiting for? I don't know. Something amazing, I guess. Me too, kid. Look at Mommy, honey. Don't, don't look down. Mommy's got you. Everything is all right. Jesus is the original Mr. Incredible. And everywhere he went, people were amazed. They were amazed at his teachings, amazed at his authority, amazed at his willingness to love outcasts and sinners, amazed at the miracles he did. Jesus was without a doubt the most amazing person who has ever lived. But have you ever thought about what does it take to an amaze an amazing person? I've known some amazing people, and I tell you, it's not easy to amaze 
amazing people. Have you ever thought about what amazed Jesus? What amazed him? There are only two times in all of the Bible where Jesus is said to have been amazed. You think about Jesus, the creator of the cosmos. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And without him, nothing was made that has been made. Jesus is the creator of the cosmos. How do you amaze someone like that? There are only two things in all of the New Testament that were said to have amazed Jesus. And I think you're going to be amazed by what they are. Here's the first one. In, um, in Luke chapter 7, we get the story of the centurion. And Jesus has just finished his uh, sermon on the plain from Luke chapter 6, 5 and 6, where he's preached this incredible um, teaching to his disciples as well as to some of the crowds that were there. And when he finished all of this, Luke chapter 7, verse 1, to the people who were listening, he entered uh, Capernaum, and there a centurion's servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. And the centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, This man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and he's built our synagogue. So Jesus went with him. Here we're introduced to a centurion whose servant is sick. Now Matthew writes this same story as Luke does, but he mentions a few extra details. First of all, that the centurion servant was not only sick, he was paralyzed and he was in excruciating pain and he was on death's door when the centurion sent this delegation of Jewish leaders to Jesus. Now, centurions were the backbone of the Roman army. They were the boots on the ground. They got stuff done. And as the name might tip you off a little bit, a centurion actually saw, uh, oversaw, give or take, about how many, stu uh, how many uh, soldiers? About 100, yeah, give or take. It would have been like a lieutenant or a captain in the military. He may have been a, a Gentile God-fearer. Now, uh, God-fearers in the Gentile world were people who were worshipers of God. They would come to the, the, the temple, but they could not come very far because of their ethnicity. They were not allowed to go all the way into the temple. And many of these God-fearers were worshipers of God, but they were prevented from becoming full converts to Judaism because of one small surgery required. A very unpleasant, very uncomfortable surgery for adult males, and that was the rite of circumcision. Not really very pleasant. But most of these Gentile god these, um, these centurions, they were usually required to serve for 20 years in the military. And a lot of them were not permitted to marry because they needed to be free from all of the obligations of marriage and family in order to serve Rome in that way. All four, all four of the centurions that are mentioned in the Gospels are actually mentioned favorably, which is unusual coming from a Jewish perspective to mention these Gentile uh, centurions on, in a favorable light. Now, I picture the centurion as the kind of guy whose life is in order. Now, how many of you are sitting next to someone who is extremely organized? I, I see a few hands, especially some very enthusiastic hands over here in the Kalmbach section. Very organized. So this guy's like Rod. You open his, you open his closet, and he's got his, all of his helmets lined up, and all of his sandals are all in this perfect little line, and they've, they, they're polished, and they're clean, and they're neat, and everything is in order. And I've seen this guy when he, he rolls his tent up. I mean, he, he wipes everything perfectly clean. You can't put away a, a dirty tent. That's, that's the centurion. He's got his, his life in order. But not only is he super organized like this, He's also a man of integrity. In fact, so much so that, um, that he, he's sensitive to the Jewish people. He's sensitive to their cultural, their cultural customs because Jewish, the Jewish elders even give him their endorsement even though he's not one of them. He's not a Jew. And Jews in the fir first century would not have contact with Gentiles, let alone um, come into their homes because it would make them ceremonially Unclean. And so the centurion actually sends some Jewish city council members on his behalf to ask Jesus to heal his servant. And when they found Jesus, they begged him to come, saying, this guy deserves your time, Jesus. He's a man of good moral character. In fact, he even helped build um, our synagogue, Jesus, that you've taught in many times here in Capernaum. This guy helped build that. It was unusual in the first century 
for interracial relationships to respect each other in a way that both could thrive. We wouldn't know anything about that in our day. Saturian gives us actually a much needed example for our own times. And I'm not saying we need to be woke, but I'm saying we need to be sensitive to other people and honor their cultural nuances in whatever ways that we can. That's just part of loving our neighbor, amen? Part of loving our neighbor is being sensitive. And this, this Gentile God-fearer, he sends Jewish guys to go and talk to the Jewish guy. And we're going to see more of that here in just a minute. But for now, I opened my talk this morning with the question, what amazes Jesus? And I told you that there are only two times in Scripture where Jesus is said to have been amazed. I want to show you the first one. The first one is actually in Nazareth in Mark chapter 6, verses 1 to 6. It reads like this. It says, Jesus left there, left Nazareth, his hometown, and he went to, he, he went to his hometown accompanied by his disciples. And when the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, he asked. And they took offense at him. And then verse 5 says this, He could not do many miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at what? He was amazed at their lack of faith. So the first time Jesus is amazed is when those who should have faith don't. These are people that grew up around him. These are People who knew him and knew his family, they were familiar with Jesus. And you know what they say about familiarity? It breeds what? Contempt. Jesus said, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown. These people knew him, but their familiar led to apathy and contempt, not to faith. This applies to those of us who have grown up in the church. We're so familiar with the stories. In fact, even with this story's some of us are yawning because we've, we've heard the story about the centurion. We've, we've heard these stories a hundred times. They can breed contempt. We have faith, or we say we have faith, but a lot of times we live as practical atheists because of that familiarity that produces apathy. And the centurion's story, um, he's familiar, but he's not familiar with Jesus except by reputation. So read with me and we'll find out what happens next in verse 6. So Jesus went with him and uh, he's not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. Talk about cultural sensitivity here. That's why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I tell this one, go and he goes. And to that one, come and he comes. And I say to this servant, do this. And he does it. Jesus is about to do an incredible miracle that isn't the point of the story. And I ask us this morning, how in the world can a, a miraculous remote healing like this, that's so amazing, not be the point of the story? And the answer is because Jesus is about to point out something that's even more amazing than what he is about to do. When the centurion finds out that Jesus is coming to his house, he sends a delegation of Jewish people to talk him out of coming to his house. Don't bother me. Don't, don't come into my house, but simply speak the word of healing and it will happen. As a centurion, he's saying, I, I know how authority works. When I give commands to a soldier, I tell him to go, and he goes, and to that one come, and he comes. And when I say the word, it gets done. He says, I understand authority. And this is what's most amazing about this, is this centurion, who's not even a child of Abraham, the father of faith, this centurion, who's a Gentile, he's the one who's saying, Jesus, I believe in your authority and I believe that when you say the word, it's going to happen. This is now the second instance where Jesus is said to be amazed. The first one in Nazareth because the people who should have faith don't. And this time he's amazed when those who shouldn't have faith do, right? Those are the two things that amaze Jesus. He's amazed at faith. That's what amazes him. You want to know what amazes the, the God of creation? It's when people believe in a God that they can't see. Yeah? 
That's what amazes God. That's what amazed Jesus. And Jesus takes this moment in verse 9. I want you to see what happens. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd that was following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Jesus is seizing a teachable moment here and he turns to his disciples and the rest of the people that are following him and says, that's the kind of faith I want you to have. The kind of faith that is uncommon. And this foreigner's faith put Israel's faith, not to mention yours and mine as well, to shame. Sometimes I get deep in thought. I know that's hard for you to imagine. But occasionally it happens. And I get so deep in thought. How many of you have been on a, on, a, on a thought train and you're trying to keep that train of thought and you don't want to be interrupted by anything? And so sometimes I, I kind of go into autopilot. I'll be wandering around the house doing the mundane, right? Just the normal stuff of life. But I've, I've got my mind on something else and I'm preoccupied. And I'll go into the kitchen. And I don't know if you've, you've gone into a room and you forgot why you were there. And you turn around two or three times like a dog looking for a place to lay down, and you still can't remember. So you go out of the room, and then you walk back in thinking maybe it'll trigger your memory. And you know what? Most of the time it does, right? This is me. I'm wandering around the kitchen. I've got a cold drink in my hand, and I'm looking around, and I'm like, and I open the oven. No, that's not what I want. And I close it. And I, oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. I go to the freezer, and I open it, and I grab some ice and put it in my drink. And my wife's been watching this the whole time and she loves to rub salt in the wound. She sees what's going on and she says, what you doing? <laughs> uh, I'm get, getting some ice for my, in the oven. <sighs> it makes about as much sense to look for ice in an oven as it does to look for faith among the Gentiles. That's what the people of Israel thought in the first century in Jesus' day, when they thought of those with the most faith, when they thought of people who could really impress God with their faith, they weren't thinking of Gentiles, they were thinking of true Israelites, right? The children of Abraham, the father of faith. Now, of course, we know from Romans 9 through 11 that any person who exercises the faith of Abraham can become a child of Abraham. Amen? And that's you. And that's me. So it's no longer divided on racial lines. It's, it's all about whether we are children of Abraham like this centurion through an amazing faith. So I was thinking about this. I was thinking about how Last week, Aaron talked about Jesus' command not to judge. And sometimes for us in the church, we run to judgment too quickly that just because someone isn't yet a part of the church or isn't in the church yet, that they must not have any, any faith. Sometimes those with the most faith, they're not even a part of the church yet. Sometimes we rush to judgment I ask you this this morning, can the church be a place where people who are searching and seeking, where they can, they can belong, maybe even before they fully believe yet? And when that happens, the church becomes a vibrant place where seekers and lost people, they come looking and they don't come into the church and find judgment. They find people who say, you know what? Sometimes, just as Jesus did, we find people of faith who aren't yet part of a faith community. And they're seeking. And there's a lot of people who, who are right there. They're right on the edge. And they, they believe and they have this incredible kind of faith, even though they don't even know yet fully who they have faith in. Well, Jesus' miracle, of course, takes a back seat to this humble faith of someone who had no reason to have any. And it's the centurion who's held up by Jesus as the gold standard of faith. And I think the story is told because Luke is saying to each one of us that no matter who we are or what our story is, we can be rich in the currency of the kingdom. Being part of the kingdom of God, it's, it's not about our, our racial pedigree. Um, it's, it's not about religious activity or tithing or fasting or giving to the building fund, though we might ask you to do that at some point. 
It's not about any of the religious things that you might think are things that elevate your resume above the person sitting next to you. It's about one thing. It's not about being good enough. The point of the story we can apply to our lives is that we're called to imitate the simple faith of a centurion because that's what catches the attention of heaven. That's what amazes Jesus. It amazes Jesus when he finds faith in someone who has no reason to have any. Hebrews 11 reminds us, without faith it's impossible to please God. Um, Jesus is approached by some people in John chapter 6, verse 28. And he's asked, what must we do to do the works of God? What must we do to do the works of God? Notice the works is, is plural. What must we do to do the works of God? I want you to see this passage on a slide, okay? What must we do to do the works of God? He replied, the work of God, singular, right? The work of God is this. So what is it that God's looking for? What's the work he's looking for? To believe. It's really that simple. This is the primary thing that needs to be on your faith resume. Simple faith in Jesus. And that's that kind of faith that eclipses whatever else you think your religious resume might lack. Because faith is the true currency of the kingdom. It's the true currency. New life in Jesus has never been about what you can do. It's always about trusting in what God has done and what God will do for you. And I want you to think about your life today. Think about the scenarios you might find yourself in today. Maybe you've been struggling to hold a failing marriage together. And it's not going so well. Do you believe in the power of Jesus to heal? Maybe you've had a recent diagnosis and you're struggling with, that, with what that might mean for your future. Do you have faith in Jesus? Maybe you've been coming on Monday nights and you've been coming to our awesome addiction recovery program, um, Recovering with Faith. You've been coming to that. Or maybe you haven't been coming to that yet, but you've been going to other meetings and it's not going very well. And you're thinking, I don't know how I can overcome this. And the question is, do you believe in the power of Jesus? Maybe, like me, I sat down yesterday to do my taxes. And I looked at how much money I thought I had and now how much money I, I don't have, right? And you look at the figures and you look at how much is coming in and how much is going out. And you're thinking to yourself, oh my goodness, I don't know how this is going to pencil out. And maybe instead of panicking and being being filled with an anxiety, maybe we need to drop to our knees and say, Lord, I know you can stretch this. I know you can make this enough. I trust in you. I trust in your power. Maybe you've got an anger problem or a lust problem or a jealousy problem or a relationship fallout problem. And every healing today is like this one that we're seeing in the centurion's life in some sense. That if Jesus healed when he wasn't physically present then, he can certainly do the same now. And yet for a lot of us, we have a hard time believing that Jesus is still acting that way on our behalf. I finished this sermon last service and I had a guy come up to me during the, 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 the intermission in between services. And he said, you know, the, the thing I'm wrestling with right now is the difference between having the faith that God can do what he wants to do and yet also trusting that his will, if he chooses not to heal, that his will is still perfect and his plan is still perfect right for my life and I happen to know the situation of course and and so we started talking about that and one of the things that I, I, I spoke to him about is I said listen whether you're the centurion in the story or the story we're about to get here in just a minute where Jesus is going to raise to life a, a, a widow's dead son right both of these people were healed they were ultimately saved from death but neither one of them are around today it was a temporary healing. And every time the Lord heals in this life, it is a temporary healing. But what we're going to get to here in a moment is that these temporary healings point to an ultimate healing. The ultimate healing when we stand before the Lord, we get a new resurrection body, and there will be no more so sorrow, no more crying, no more death, and no more pain, for the old order of things will have passed away. And every single time that God does a miracle of healing in somebody's life, it points to the ultimate healing that each one of us will eventually experience in the ultimate kingdom in heaven. 
So what do you do when life throws you an uppercut and catches you off guard and you're disoriented with grief and pain when you don't even have enough wits about you to exercise faith or even offer a prayer? And that happens. That's what stands out so beautifully in the next story. I want you to see the next story here. Jesus, uh, soon afterward, verse 11, went to a town called Nain. It's about six miles from Nazareth. And his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. And as he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, Don't cry. I don't recommend you say that at the next funeral you're at to people who've just lost a loved one. Probably on the top ten list of wrong things to say at a funeral, that's probably in the top one or two. Widows in the first century represented the most vulnerable in society. Along with orphans and migrants, they were victims of, oftentimes victims of social injustice. They were usually poor, in fact, so poor that the, the original language here for the word widow, the root of that word actually means empty or destitute. That's how they were seen. And childless widows were in a class by themselves as the most impoverished. As a widow, she would have been required to wear widow's garments, which is probably how Jesus knows when he enters Nain that this woman is a widow and she's following behind the bier, the casket of her only son who's just died. This funeral procession is in process and she's on her way out to bury her only son and you can imagine her grief. And Jesus is moved with compassion and he says, don't cry. And I, I'm thinking, I wonder what this woman is thinking when Jesus comes up to her and she's about to bury her only son. It's all she has left in the world. And he says, don't cry. It's really a pretty, pretty cruel thing to say. It's a funeral for an only son. And if you've ever had a tragedy hit you like a gut punch and knock the wind out of you, you know where she's at right now. You've been through a loss like this, a tragic loss. You know what she's feeling. You know the heart-wrenching pain that she's going through. And when that happens, it sometimes feels like somebody just pulled the drain plug and all the joy just drained out of your life. And you wonder to yourself, I don't know what it's like to feel normal again. You might be thinking, God, where are you? And this story reminds us, second application, that Jesus is not only present in your pain, not only present in your grief, but even something more amazing, he has authority over it. Sometimes we think of tragedy as a sign that God has forsaken us, right? God, where are you? Why weren't you here? God, if you had been here, this wouldn't have happened. That's what Mary and Martha told Jesus when their brother Lazarus died. If you had been here, this wouldn't have happened. And sometimes we see tragedy as if it's a sign that God is not present, that he's forsaken us somehow. So which is it, and how can we know? Well, we know today from this story, because Jesus never went anywhere by accident, right? Nain is not really that close. It's, it's at least a day's journey from Capernaum where he was doing his ministry. Now, maybe he was on his way home to see his parents and happened to be passing through there, but ten minutes either way of this, he would have missed the whole funeral procession. Jesus went to Nain on purpose to meet a widow in her grief. He went there on purpose. Psalm 34, 18, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He saves those who are crushed in spirit. And if Jesus went to Nain on cue to meet a grieving widow, why would he not also be present in your pain and mine? Why would he forsake you? If he went out of his way, if he went to this little town of Nain, which is, by the way, tiny, it's smaller than Nazareth, if he showed up in Nain specifically for a widow in grief, why wouldn't he show up for you too? But Jesus doesn't just show up at the funeral. He doesn't just show up and grieve. I want you to notice in the story that he speaks with authority. 
to the very root cause of her grief. And he says, don't cry, which I think is an absolutely cruel thing to say unless it anticipates what Jesus is about to do, right? You ever notice that Jesus ruined every funeral he ever went to? <laughs> you ever notice that? There are four gravesides that are recorded in Scripture where Jesus actually showed up there. Um, the first one was the raising of the synagogue ruler Jairus' daughter at Capernaum. Showed up at her funeral and raised her from the dead. Then he went to Lazarus, the brother of Mary and Martha, and what did they say when he said, move the stone out of the way? They said, Lord, he eats Thanks. He's been in there for three days. There's a decomposition process that's already begun in this hot Mediterranean climate. And he says, they said, Lord, he, he, but it, it's the third day. It's, it's not a good odor. It's, it's not good. It's like the pastor after too many bean burritos, right? It's a bad smell. Don't move. And he said, move the stone. Move the stone. And he called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out doing his impression of a penguin, right? And he's all bound hand and foot, still wrapped in all the grave clothes. He ruined Lazarus' funeral. That was pretty fun. In this story, he ruins a funeral procession. Notice what happens in verses 14 and 15. After he said, don't cry to the widow, he said, he went up and touched the beer that they were carrying him on. They, it was an open um, bed kind of that was carried by people. And the bearer stood still and he said, young man, I say to you, get up. And the dead man sat up and began to talk and Jesus gave him back to his mother. You've heard of the walking dead. This is now the talking dead. Right? He just sits up and just starts talking, just jabbering. The last graveside Jesus went to was his own. And with nothing more than authoritative word at each one of these, these graves, Jesus raises the dead. Think about early on that first Easter Sunday morning, the women came to the tomb. And they're met by an angel. The stones rolled away, of course, and there's an angel that's sitting there. And the angel says, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. And I never really noticed these last words, but he is risen just as he said. When Jesus speaks to death, it comes to life. And the same power that raised Jairus' daughter, the same power that raises this widow's son, the same power that raised Lazarus, was at work in Jesus. And his authoritative word brings the dead to life. These two stories today call us to faith, each in their own unique way. The story of the widow's son calls us to faith even when we're overwhelmed by grief. And I don't know what you've come in carrying this morning, but I know life is hard. It's painful. And stuff happens. And sometimes we come in and we're carrying a heavy burden. That's where that widow was. I want you to notice that the centurion had faith and then saw a miracle. And that's, of course, what we would expect, to have faith and then see a miracle. That's how we expect things to work. Jesus says faith can move mountains. But the widow saw a miracle first and then had faith. And Jesus can act whether we have faith or whether we're so lost in grief and pain we just don't know how. So whether you're here today and you, you've got this incredible faith that Jesus can, can act and he can work in your life, or whether you're here today and you're just looking for something to overcome with life right now, overcome with pain and struggle, Jesus can be there for you. As the worship team comes up, I want to close with a passage of Scripture from the book of John. Book of John, chapter 14. John, chapter 14. And just this week I was called to the 
deathbed of a dear woman who's walked with Jesus her entire life. And I went to the hospice house in Bend at Partners in Care. And I entered this woman's room, and she was in her final hours. And I sat beside her, her bed, and I talked to her, and I prayed with her. And I tried to think, what would be a comfort in those final hours? She couldn't respond to me, but I know that the last thing to go is our hearing. So I opened my Bible to John 14, verse 1. And what could give comfort to a dear saint in their final hours more than this? Jesus says to his disciples, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms, and if that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, so that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. When that day comes for me, I want assurance that what Jesus says in John 14 about a place that he's prepared for me is true. These two stories are, are meant to convince us that if Jesus did these things for those who had simple faith in him, then his promise of the resurrection and the eternity in heaven that he's told us about is also true. And I don't know where this story finds you today, but whether you're like the centurion, maybe you feel unworthy because your spiritual resume seems lacking. Or maybe you're more like the widow whose life has knocked her dizzy with grief and loss. Jesus calls you to believe in his power to save. You want to amaze the Lord today? There's nothing that amazes him more than people who shouldn't have faith. They do. And you know, the truth of it is, that's all of us. If you're here today and you've put your trust in Jesus, Jesus tells Thomas after the resurrection, he says, Blessed are you, Thomas, because you have seen me, the resurrected Jesus, you have believed. Even more blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed. That's you. That's me. This morning, if you're needing prayer, life's been challenging this week. It's knocked you down. Steve and Candy are amazing prayer warriors. They're over here on the side, and they would love to pray with you. They're great people. They will listen to you. They'll pray. And they'll pray a prayer of faith, just like Courtney sang up here, speaking the name of Jesus and praying a prayer of faith over you for whatever it is that you're asking the Lord for healing from. Maybe you're here and you say, there's something about this Jesus, and I need to make a first-time decision to put my trust in him. Just like that centurion who said, Lord, I'm not worthy to have you come into my house. But just speak the word and my servant will be healed. You can exercise that kind of faith today. Jesus is not going to physically show up in this room for you, but the, Spirit, the, the scripture says that the Holy Spirit will come into your life and Jesus will begin to make all things new and different for you. And that's what's happened to every other person in this room. I'm going to be right down here in the front. If you need to make a decision this morning, a first time decision, I'd love to chat with you down here in the front. Otherwise, I'd love to chat with you at the Welcome Center as well. Let's stand and sing this closing song of invitation today. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect.